Hello there, Reverend Tracy here with our worship for this sixth Sunday after Trinity. We're well into ordinary time now, the green season, and our gospel reading about the weeds and the grain has prompted me to share some suitably green pictures I took on an evening walk about a month ago on the Jubilee Way, a route between Melton Mowbray and Beaver Castle with wonderful views out across the Trent Valley. It's highly recommended if you're able to get out and about. This morning's music is the Gloria, recorded by our church choir in their own homes. This is one of the pieces of music I've most missed whilst we've been able to worship in person, a piece I was looking forward to being able to enjoy again at Easter after the stripped-down liturgy of Lent. But in fact, we'll need to wait a little bit longer yet, so it's good to be able to share it with you today. So let's start in prayer with the collect set for today. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. There is not any God beside you whose care is for all people, to whom you should prove that you have not judged unjustly. For your strength is the source of righteousness, and your sovereignty over all causes you to spare all. For you show your strength when people doubt the completeness of your power, and you rebuke any insolence among those who know it. Although you are O sovereign in strength, you judge with mildness, and with great forbearance you govern, for you have power to act whenever you choose. Through such works you have taught your people that righteousness must be kind, and you have filled your children with good hope, because you have you give repentance for sins. This is the word of the Lord.
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to somebody who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves asked him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and tie them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone who has ears listen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Today's Gospel reading is another one of Jesus' parables, and one which will be well known to many of you. Indeed, I must admit it's one of the parables which used to frighten me a bit as a child, and it probably won't come as any surprise to you that I'd always assumed and feared that I fell into the weeds category. Indeed, Jesus doesn't pull his punches here, and he's pretty uncompromising about his explanation, which, as Rob said last week, makes it difficult to offer an alternative view. But I wonder whether Jesus had to lay it on the line because his disciples were being a bit slow on the uptake. Whether this lesson about the weeds and the wheat needed to be writ large for them. I wonder if there's more to be uncovered here. There's no doubt at all that, for people familiar with subsistence agriculture, and dependent on the success of the crops they'd planted for their very survival, this image of weeds being deliberately planted amongst them is a powerful one of sabotage and subterfuge. The idea that, once sown, weeds cannot change the weedness of their nature, and the good seed must work hard for its very survival, it's uncompromising. Let them both grow together until the harvest. It seems there's no hope for the weeds, nothing to be done about them. Their fate is sealed. It's a sobering thought, a stark and arresting illustration, that distinction between the good seed and the bad weeds. But look again. I think I may have mentioned before that I studied agriculture at university, not very successfully. And I remember asking a horticulture student friend of mine the deep and searching question. So what's a weed anyway? Quick as a flash came back his response, a response I suspect based on experience. A weed, he said, is just a plant in the wrong place. A weed is just a plant in the wrong place. That's always struck me as profound and I offer it to you today. 
The gardeners among you will all know of plants which have failed to flourish because they're in the wrong part of the garden. And then they're about as much use as weeds if we don't take some swift action. But somehow we've learned to consider some plants as weeds and some as things we'd like to grow. How does that happen, I wonder, as I look out on a garden full of what I've grown accustomed to calling ornamental thistles and nettles and grasses? Well, what's the difference between an ornamental thistle and one that has you reaching for the roundup? Most, if not all, of the images I've shared with you this morning are on the continuum between wildflower and weed, but they're vital to wildlife and to the diversity of our fragile ecosystems and hedgerows. Herbalists would tell us of the healing properties of plants like yarrow, dandelion and comfrey, and increasingly nettles, elderflower and burdock find their way into teas and infusions. And they're often also quite, quite beautiful. Now, of course I say that from the privilege of a secure food supply and not having to worry about the devastating effects of crop failure for me, my family and my community, unlike the people listening to Jesus in this account. But it does seem to me that this much more blurry line between weeds and wheat the saved and the unsaved, the good and the bad, is both profoundly challenging and hopeful. Whilst plenty of Christians in good conscience, my own Sunday school teachers included, will use this parable as a dire warning of the judgment and condemnation to come, I think those things are best left to God. We can't and shouldn't ignore the message of the story but we should hold them alongside other words too, with a heart that's open to the Spirit's guidance and calling to account, but in the light of the Easter promise of resurrection and hope. And perhaps also in the light of this morning's reading from Wisdom, a reading I'm not familiar with, and one which once more prompts me to ask, why don't I know about these words too? Why, as a child, was I taught about the weeds among the wheat, but not about the mildness, forbearance, justice, righteousness of the God of wisdom? Why has it taken me so long to find out and learn to know this God, the God of gentleness and justice, of hope and transformation? who challenges our assumptions about the weediness of life and reframes and restores and renews. Because what's a weed anyway? Just a plant in the wrong place. So let us pray. Let us pray for our world and for our leaders. For those places where the impact of coronavirus is compounded by poverty, corruption or natural disaster. For those agencies seeking to respond, restore and rebuild, especially Christian Aid, CAFOD, Tear Fund and UNICEF. For those working for cooperation between the nations for economic recovery which will be sustainable and fair, for an environmental response which treasures the planet we call home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our nation and for those who hold together the fragile threads of society. For those who continue to work in our health and social care services, especially those whose work is poorly paid, unrecognised and difficult to speak about. For all working in and with our public services, health, education, justice, housing, transport. For those devising policy, securing supplies, training and developing the workforce of the future, maintaining infrastructures. 
for those amongst our elected leaders charged with responsibility for the common good, that they might act with wisdom, integrity and courage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our community and our city, for teachers and children as the final week of term concludes a difficult year, that they might celebrate and give thanks for all they've been able to achieve and be at peace with the what-ifs and the if-onlys. May they know that they are good enough and that we are grateful and proud. We pray for those reaching out to people who are isolated, hungry or afraid, especially commending to God the work of the food banks of this city. And we pray for those working at Boots, as significant redundancies are announced, and for all who are afraid for their futures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray finally for those who are close to us or about whom we care. For all who are sick at home or in hospital. For those at the very beginning of life and the very end of life and those who watch and wait with them. For those we've been unable to see over these difficult days. For our ministry team, Father Wayne, Father Rob, Reverend Kirsten, our musicians, our cleaners, Mark, our church warden, and Catherine, our administrator. For those for whom this is a time of celebration, remembering both Dorothy and Kieran, who have birthdays this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The alternative collect for today. Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the prayer Jesus taught his friends. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And finally, the post-communion prayer for today. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>